Good afternoon. Given his deep roots in the Southern Civil Rights Movement, it's perhaps not surprising that Justice Thurgood Marshall failed to grasp the full complexity, both demographic and by extension legal, of the Supreme Court's landmark 1978 case, the University of California Regents versus Bakke. In that case, four justices sided with certain sections of Justice Lewis Powell's opinion to cobble together a razor thin one vote majority on behalf of a limited defense of affirmative action in university admissions. Though Marshall was one of those four justices, he also filed a separate opinion. In it, he blasted the limited reach of the Bakke decision. Focusing exclusively on African Americans, he described their history as, quote, different in kind, not just degree, from that of other ethnic groups. For this reason, Marshall found it, quote, difficult to accept that Negroes cannot be afforded greater protection under the 14th Amendment, where it is necessary to remedy the effects of past discrimination. The exceptionally invidious history of anti-black racism, he suggested, merited at least that much jurisprudential consideration. At issue in Bakke, however, was an admissions program at the University of California Davis School of Medicine that reserved 16 out of 100 slots for not only blacks, but also Chicanos, Asians, and American Indians. Whether these other groups should be accorded, should be included alongside African Americans for affirmative action as a partial remedy for historical discrimination, Marshall did not say. What Marshall avoided, California civil rights reformers had been grappling with since at least World War II. Namely, what shape should civil rights law and policy take in a multiracial context? Carrie McWilliams broached this question in 1943. What Americans must realize, McWilliams wrote in his book, Brothers Under the Skin, what they can no longer afford to ignore is the simple and obvious fact that the color of America has changed. McWilliams' pronouncement was as prescient as it was anomalous. Presciently, it anticipated by half a century a course of similar statements made by journalists, scholars, and policymakers. Anomalously, it cut against the prevailing view of the race problem in the 1940s and for many years afterward, for that matter. To most Americans, wrote a reviewer of McWilliams' book, the race problem means only the Negro problem. No book published during the 1940s captured that conflation better than Gunnar Myrtle's landmark 1,500 page study, An American Dilemma, which bore the subtitle, The Negro Problem and Modern Democracy. Unlike Myrtle, who approached the race problem from the former Confederacy, McWilliams wrote from America's racial frontier as he referred to the West in general and the Pacific Coast in particular. From this vantage point, he maintained, we have overemphasized the Negro and failed to correlate the Negro problem with the race problems besetting other colored minorities as he described them. Implicit in McWilliams' pluralization of the race problem was the question that my work seeks to answer. Namely, how would the multiple race problems found on America's racial frontier shape and complicate the efforts of civil rights reformers to resolve them in the decades that began where Brothers Under the Skin ended? More generally, how does that history compel a rethinking of both older and newer histories of civil rights in the United States? I want to distill my argument and then try to unpack it um, in some sense an exercise in tell and show. In the large swaths of the United States where the race problem was one and the same with the Negro problem, civil rights reformers could concentrate their attention on it. Their efforts rendered resolving the Negro problem synonymous with the civil rights movement. In California, however, the presence of multiple race problems, each of which tended to attach themselves to the state's different racialized groups in different ways or degrees, militated against the making of any kind of singular civil rights movement. Instead, California experienced a diverse and largely divergent set of civil rights struggles. 
Now, this was not for try, a lack of trying to achieve something more coherent, something more cohesive, something more movement-like. From the 1940s forward, civil rights reformers issued frequent calls for unity and engaged in fleeting efforts to join forces. Nor was it for the lack of agreement over the ultimate ends that civil rights reformers pursued through the legal and legislative means that are my focus of attention. Like their counterparts across the country, California civil rights reformers espoused the basic principles of racial liberalism. While he moved away from laissez-faire doctrines in economics, McWilliams wrote about the changes wrought by New Deal liberalism, we still anachronistically pursue laissez-faire theories in population matters. Racial liberalism and racial liberals propose to correct this anachronism. Racial liberalism represented what McWilliams referred to as, quote, a movement to outlaw racial discrimination by direct legislation as well as litigation. To achieve their common aim, which is to say equality of opportunity through anti-discrimination, litigation, and legislation, civil rights reformers in California often analogize the plights of McWilliams's so-called colored minorities. They accentuated the racism in general that each group faced in order to facilitate coalition building across groups on behalf of particular anti-discrimination litigation and legislation priorities. Discrimination or unfair treatment against any minority, declared a group of attorneys for the Japanese American Citizens League in 1947, redounds to the detriment of all minorities. What was in the civil rights interest of one minority, in other words, was also in the civil rights interest of other minorities. Such analogical proximity provided the basis for a common front, at least in theory. In practice, the analogy and its presumption of a harmony of civil rights interests across racial groups, and in turn, a kind of natural alliance between them could only be pressed so far. As those same Japanese American Citizens League attorneys put it, each of the state's racial groups confronted problems that were necessarily varied and different from one another. In this way, though California civil rights reformers might have been united behind the ultimate ends and means of racial liberalism, they often found themselves divided over specific anti-discrimination measures to privilege in their litigation and legislation agendas. Distinctions without much of a difference on the diagnostic side, say variations on a general theme of racial discrimination, proved to be distinctions with a difference on the prescriptive side. Distinct civil rights priorities reflected distinct racialized experiences. Different axes of discrimination demanded different avenues of redress. And herein resided what I refer to as the kind of challenge that racial diversity posed for racial liberalism. That challenge was in turn exacerbated by the procedural imperatives of the very institutions of litigation and legislation where civil rights reformers operated, which is to say that initiating a court case or introducing a legislative bill required abstract general principles to be pressed into and pursued down discrete paths. In this way, the processes of litigation and legislation operated like a prism on light. They took something that seemed to be ostensibly the same on one side and refracted it into a whole set of constituent parts, or in this case, a set of constituent legislative and legal priorities. Right. And this together made sort of mounting a cohesive movement in California, a cohesive civil rights movement, particularly challenging for those who sought to do it. And there were plenty of people who sought to do that. My book begins with an organization called the California Federation for Civic Unity, which, which sought to do exactly what I'm describing here. It was one of the dozens of racial liberal organizations formed during the 1940s in California. But from its inception, the CFCU, confronted the difficulty of achieving the common ground it sought, a united front of all the minority groups, in the words of one of its founders, who's also an NAACP leader, in the face of the wide range of race problems that those minority groups confronted. Five years into its project, 
to, describe, uh, to sort of cohere what its leader described as a new human rights movement in California. Another leader in the organization lamented the, quote, almost complete isolation between the state's various racial and cultural groups. Six years later, the CFCU disbanded. While the CFCU was groping for common ground, there were a series of separate track challenges to California's multiracial manifestations of state, san state sanctioned segregation that unfolded in the 1940s. Lawyers representing Japanese Americans took aim at the state's alien land law, which they described as the keystone of discriminatory legislation against persons of Japanese ancestry. Lawyers representing Mexican Americans targeted the, school, school, the, the state's school segregation law and the claim by school district officials that segregation of students of Mexican descent owed to their supposed lack of English language proficiency. Finally, lawyers representing African Americans fought court enforcement of racially restrictive housing covenants whose victims in California during the 1940s were overwhelmingly African American. So what you see here is a kind of divergent set of civil rights trajectories reflected in these different cases. And that divergence continues into the 1950s as California civil rights advocates switch. In many ways, the 40s marked, um, you had compressed in a short number of years the whole arc of the Southern civil rights movement against legalized segregation. By the late 1940s, Californians had litigated away on these separate cat track challenges, its whole system of legalized segregation, and it turned to trying to enact various forms of anti-discrimination legislation while continuing to pursue other forms of litigation. During the 1950s, the NAACP, which had a regional office in San Francisco that covered the West Coast region, supplanted the California Federation for Civic Unity as the state's leading civil rights organization. Like its CFCU predecessors, leaders within the NAACP West Coast Regional Office, led by Franklin Williams, called for cooperation and unity in the pursuit of a common goal. That common goal, however, which McWill with Williams, Franklin Williams, who's head of the NAACP West Coast Regional Office, that common goal of equality of opportunity for all people provided insufficient adhesive power. On the one hand, you see the NAACP pursuing fair employment practices legislation and fair housing litigation beyond racially restrictive covenants as a solution to what their leaders describe as not only problems besetting African Americans, but all other Californians of <laughs> color. On the other hand, you see advocacy organizations on behalf of Japanese Americans and Mexican Americans belying this kind of reasoning by analogy as they pursue a whole set of other anti-discrimination legislation priorities. For example, in 1953, when the NAACP declared fair employment practices to be, quote, the number one legislative aim of all the civil rights forces in California, the burgeoning Mexican-American community, uh, community service organization, where a young Cesar Chavez was cutting his activist teeth, launched what would become a nearly decade-long campaign to legislate old age pensions for long-term resident non-citizens a disproportionate number of whom were Mexican born. Created in the late 1940s, the community service organization, according to its organizer, sought to tackle their, meaning Mexican American problems first, which were rooted in their, meaning Mexican Americans, peculiar economic, social, and political status, as he put it. With the election of 1958 in California, Civil rights, um, or more specifically, really, an NAACP vision of civil rights assumed an unprecedented place in California's legislative politics. Unlike Republican gubernatorial incumbent Goodwin Knight, who denied the existence of, quote, strained race relations in California, newly elected Democrat Governor Pat Brown recognized, quote, profound problems in the area of human relations. He identified dispelling discrimination as one of a handful of tasks necessary to build a, a great state. To this end, he made civil rights synonymous with the agenda that the NAACP had been pursuing since its inception as a regional office in 1944, 
In particular, Brown threw himself behind fair employment practices in 1959 and later fair housing, which culminated in a 1961-63 bill. In addition, Brown appointed the NAACP's regional director, Franklin Williams, as an assistant attorney general in charge of a newly created constitutional rights section in the state's attorney general's office. As Williams had done during the 1950s, and as Mick Williams had done before him in the 1940s, Brown reasoned by analogy from the plight of African Americans to that of other non-white groups. He posited a harmony of civil rights interests among them, even as leaders representing organizations from the largest one of those groups, Mexican Americans, pursued a civil rights agenda that focused on other priorities. The CSO, for example, continued to fight for old age pensions for long-term resident non-citizens as its top priority. In addition, Cesar Chavez, who would eventually break with the CSO and launch what would become the United Farm Workers, identified a host of other issues for the state's farm workers who he deemed to be, quote, synonymous with Mexican Americans in California. Those other issues including stemming the tide of Mexican immigrant farm workers and securing for domestic farm workers a minimum wage, unemployment insurance, and collective bargaining rights. On these issues, unlike fair employment and fair housing, Governor Brown failed to take action. His inaction helps explain the chasm separating Brown's proclamation in 1963 that no other state could point to more tremendous gains from minority citizens, as Brown put it. So that, on the one side, from Chavez's rhetorical query, which he wrote a handful of Democratic legislators in California in the 60s, that went, when will the Mexican American receive some meaningful legislation from those Democrats who they support loyally year in and year out. Though a speechwriter for Governor Brown would remember the years 1959 to 1963 as a time when, quote, liberalism was rolling, it was not exactly rolling in the direction that Chavez and an increasing number of Mexican American leaders desired. Moreover, with the passage of California's fair housing law in 1963, liberalism would soon be rolling off a cliff. Indeed, Ronald Reagan's trouncing of Brown in November 1966 stemmed in good measure from Reagan's support of an anti-fair housing initiative. Proposition 14 passed by a landslide in November 64, only to be overturned by the California Supreme Court in 1966 to the outrage of <laughs> millions of California voters, and Reagan made hay of that. While Reagan campaigned against fair housing, he also campaigned for a growing number of Mexican-American voters for whom the Brown administration had proven to be a disappointment. In doing so, Reagan targeted constituencies that a leading Brown aide had identified in 1965 as, quote, the base of any Democratic vote and the possibilities of any Democratic victory. Moreover, Reagan's smashing success with white, white labor and moderate, though unprecedented for a Republican success with Mexican Americans, underscored the fragility of the coalition of Democrats with labor and minority groups that another leading Brown advisor had predicted in 1960 would last for years to come. By the late 60s and early 70s, California's mostly separate civil rights struggles collided. During Reagan's first term in office, the NAACP switched its major emphasis from fair housing toward de facto school segregation. When school desegregation litigation yielded victories in LA in 70, in San Francisco in 71, forced busing became to its opponents, including Reagan, what forced housing had been in the 1960s. Now, if busing to promote desegregation was not combustible enough in California as it was across the country, it was complicated in California as it was in Denver and other places in the West by bilingual education. Bilingual education stood at least in tension, if not at loggerheads, with desegregation. As one Mexican-American legal defense and educational fund leader explained in 1971, MALDEF had been created in 68 as a kind of, it had been modeled after the NAACP LDF. The danger in multiracial school systems undergoing court-ordered desegregation is that the Chicano and Chinese minorities will be so dispersed to achieve desegregation 
that they will lose or fail to receive needed educational programs, most notably bilingual education. Reagan exploited this tension in his bid 1970 for re-election. He insisted that, quote, forced busing would undermine bilingual education. If Reagan's, which by the way, he had supported in a series of ways in his first term um, in office. If Reagan's opposition to forced busing in the campaign of 1970 was an extension of his opposition to forced housing in the campaign of 66, so too was his support for bilingual education during the late 60s and early 70s, an extension of his effort during that time to reach out to some Mexican American voters. This tension between desegregation and bilingual education would play itself out in especially dramatic fashion in San Francisco in the early 70s. There, a desegregation suit brought by the NAACP encountered stiff resistance from members of the city's Mexican descent and especially Chinese communities. At the same time, a bilingual education suit brought on behalf of non-English speaking Chinese descent students with input from uh, attorneys representing Mexican, -American, Mexican descent students would score a major Supreme Court victory in 1974. Now in recent years, historians have sought to stretch the chronological, substantive, and geographic boundaries of the traditional Southern-focused civil rights movement. Chronologically, the new so-called long civil rights movement scholarship locates the movement's origins during the New Deal and its acceleration during World War II rather than in the mid-50s with Brown and the Montgomery bus boycott. Substantively, that scholarship emphasizes how the movement's reform aspirations were from the outset more than simply focused on the attainment of the dismantling of formal segregation. And geographically, it highlights the breadth and depth of civil rights struggles in various northern locales occurring contemporaneous with rather than subsequent to those in the south. These revisions have been critically important, yet they remain woefully incomplete. In particular, the efforts of long civil rights movement historians to direct our attention northward have either left the West out or simply conflated it with the North, defined, as they often do, as anything outside of the former Confederacy. Yet, if racism and the attempts to combat it manifested themselves in different ways on either side of the Mason-Dixon line, as one leading Northern civil rights historian contends, they manifested themselves in even more different ways in the West. In a word, California civil rights struggles demonstrated how the states, and by, the ex by extension, the country's civil rights past, must not only be understood as long, but wide. Wide geographically, meaning the inclusion of the West, wide demographically, meaning beyond black and white, and above all, wide substantively in terms of the axes of discrimination that civil rights reformers tackled and the avenues of address they pursued. Only through widening the lenses of US civil rights history in these ways will historians be able to present what leading Western historian Patty Limerick called for years ago, namely a truly national view of the movement against racial discrimination. When that truly national view of the movement against racial discrimination is written, it will demonstrate how the problem of the color line, as W.E.B. Du Bois famously characterized the problem of the 20th century, has in fact long been one of color lines. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I want to thank you all for sticking to the very end. Um, and also thank Charles for organizing this symposium, the organizing committee for inviting me and Liz Gardner and others for making the administrative aspects of this possible. I want to start by unpacking my title, uh, which is Eugenic Frontier Silence Lives. And I was thinking as I was getting ready to present that, you know, really we could call what happened in California the closing of the eugenic frontier. 
and frontier in the sense of edge and extremes, that the U American eugenics movement really went to its extremes in California. And I talk about that in my book, Eugenic Nation, and I'm going to talk about that today in terms of one aspect of eugenics, which was forced sterilization in state institutions. And that relates to the second part of my title, which is Silenced Lives. And this is a double, has a double meaning. On the one hand, what I'm going to share with you is how do you work with a particular type of data set or documents where subjects are literally kind of institutional subjects are being silenced and erased, and also their reproductive capacity is being silenced or uh, irrevocably um, taken away from them. Let's see, how does this sit to that, or here we go. Okay, so first of all, a little bit of background um, on California eugenics and what I mean when I say that eugenics was taken to the extreme in California. You know, the very kind of simple and dirty kind of explanation of the eugenics movement, it's something that arose globally, the turn of the, the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, it was very much related to ideas of heredity, the application of ideas of heredity through experts often attached to the state, with the idea that the body politic could be controlled and regulated often through, through a variety of you know, both informal and legal mechanisms. And we think, when you think of eugenics, you often, people often think, if they're first introduced to it, to Nazi Germany, where those measures were obviously taken to their extreme, in the most extreme case, to euthanasia. But if we move across the spectrum to what would be more considered more positive eugenics, and I've written about that in the context of better baby contests, but if we move across, you know, really kind of closer to that negative side is <clears throat> forced sterilization. And this is what occurred before things moved into the concentration camps in Nazi Germany and what occurred in um, other places in, in Europe and other parts of the world. Now, California, Indiana was actually, interestingly, the first state to pass a eugenic sterilization law in 1907, and we could talk about what that's, the, that's another kind of frontier that we could talk about, but California followed quickly with the 1909 sterilization law. And one of the very important things about this law is that more than 33 states passed sterilization laws in the 20th century. Many of them were contested um, on uh, legal bases of lack of due process, you know, constitutional violation, et cetera. But California's was, was not contested at the Supreme Court level or any higher level. I'll get to that in a bit. But it basically, it stayed on the books until it was repealed in 1979. So for 70 years, you have a, a sterilization law on the books in California. Also, in these 33 states I mentioned, we know that officially over 60,000 sterilizations were recorded. California performed 20,000 of these. So California, in and of, on its own, performed one-third, or about 35% of all the sterilizations in the United States during the 20th century. And in fact, two institutions, Sonoma and Patton, um, performed about, um, I think they performed 10,000 total, so they themselves performed a large number of these. Um, the sterilizations occurred in two different types of institutions, and we've heard um, in the earlier presentation about some of the psychiatric institutions um, from Angela, Stockton and Napa. So they were performed in what we though were called sane asylums, or what we now call psychiatric hospitals, and also in what I'm going to focus on a bit more today, which were the feeble-minded homes, which which were um, homes for what we might call today the developmentally disabled, the mentally retarded. All of these really kind of emerged in California in the late 19th and were established by the early 20th century in terms of edifices and institutions. Um, the majority of these sterilizations occurred between 19 in the 1920s and then 1953. In 1953, there was a change to the law, which I can talk about. And they tapered off, but it's really important to note that they did not end completely. And they really did not end until 1979, and there are even a few cases after that. Um, OK, so I've been working on this issue of eugenics for a while. and. One of the things that's very hard to get at is what actually happened in institutions? What actually happened in these state institutions and what were the experiences of the inmates or the patients who were sterilized? So I'm interested on in what was the daily universe in a kind of Goffman-esque way, what was the daily life, the daily universe of the institutions, and then also what more can we know, can we learn about sterilization? 
So what the records I'm using for this are not the kinds of records that you could go and consult in the Bancroft where you would have put in a requisition slip and then you would have a box presented to you. In fact, the records I'm talking about are 15,000 sterilization orders that I happened upon in the context of my research that are housed in the bottom drawer of the basement of the California Department of um, Mental Health in Sacramento. And after many years of trying of calling Anyone I, who would really respond to my call at the you know, de developmental services department at the level of Sacramento, I talked to people in, in Stockton, in Sonoma, in Napa, um, I was fortunate enough to get access to these sterilization orders. And they even let me microfilm them. But part of the process, and this is one of the interesting things about working in institutions and medical records, is this required in California has a very well developed, as it should, um, process of institutional review boards, human subjects protections, HIPAA waivers, and so on. So and the point is, is that it took a lot of work to get access to this unusual set of materials, which now I'm figuring out exactly what I can do with them. Um, so what were, these, what were these records? So again, they cover from about 1922 to 1952. And what they are, and I'll show you examples from them in a minute, is they were the orders that were sent from the psychiatric institutions or the mental feeble homes signed by the superintendents to Sacramento for filing. So they weren't actually, one of the interesting things is according to the law, they weren't actually necessary because the law did not require that this kind of consent or order be provided, but nonetheless they felt compelled to do so. And that in and of itself is an interesting question. So I'm, one of the things I'm trying to figure out is why were they generated? I think part of it has to do with the whole, the ritual of gaining consent um, in the institution itself. And also it has to do with just the bureaucratization of what went on in institutions where everything was incredibly bureaucratic. Almost everything required a requisition, required a piece of paper, and so on. Um, and one of the things I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm trying to figure out is what can you actually glean from these kinds of highly bureaucratic documents that erase subjects? So I'm doing two things with them. And this is really kind of the challenge for me is I'm trying to combine quantitative and qualitative analysis. So the quantitative analysis is putting together a database where I'm working, I have a graduate student who's working with me on this, Natalie Lira, she's doing a fantastic job. And what we're doing is putting together a database of these 15,000 records. We have to, we can't, we have to take away all identifying information, but what we want to figure out is what can we learn about patterns of sterilization, about age, about gender, about ethnicity, about sending county, about diagnosis, and about change over time. Because until now, we know very little about who was actually sterilized in state institutions. We know it's 20,000 people at least, but we don't know who they were. We don't know what their circumstances were. So this database, once I hope we complete it by the summer, will be able to generate that quantitative data. And I will be able to work with some of the statisticians at the University of Michigan who I did a previous project with, and they know how to do all this multivariate regressions and analysis, which I don't, but I can work with them on that, and that's very exciting. Um, so just from our preliminary kind of statistical work, one of the things that I, we have been able to find out is that um, there was dis highly disproportionate sterilization of Spanish surnamed individuals, uh, men, and, men and women at the feeble-minded homes, which consisted of Sonoma and Pacific Colony. So two of the 11 institutions were kind of for mental retardation. So there's what I would suspect to be statistically significant disproportionate sterilization. Um, and I can't always tell exactly where people are from. The majority are from Mexico, but they're also Chileans, Salvadorians, a wide variety of those. Also Portuguese, a sizable number of Portuguese. So that we've been able to determine from 1937 to 1948. So for example, at the Pacific Colony, those with Spanish surnames were 26% of those sterilized. Um, at Sonoma, 19% of those sterilized. Now, one of the things that's important to figure out if you're looking at sterilization rates will, was compared to what in terms of the population in the institution. So we've been gathering data about what were the actual rates of, of admission. So the highest rate of admission for Spanish surname individuals that we can find at any of these institutions, and we've included patent in this, although I won't talk about it much in this talk, is at, at the height, it's usually at the most 3%. 
So if you compare an often in Pacific Colony, it's less than 1%. So less than 1% of Spanish surnamed individuals admitted 26% of those sterilized. Um, so here, this, 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 this is our playing around with uh, some of the graph programs in PowerPoint, just to give you a flavor of what this looks like. And there's the famous pie chart, so you can get a sense. So that's the, the quantitative, and I'm really excited about that, and I do think it's going to show think, really interesting patterns also about age and about um, disproportionate sterilization, in particular of um, young Latinas aged like 15 through 20. Um, you know, who often ended up in the juvenile court and then were sent to, to Sonoma or Pacific Colony. Um, and that relates to what do these, what can these, what can we glean from these records in terms of the qualitative analysis? Um, and what I've found thus far, far, and I will share with you a bit today, are stories of discrimination, dislocation, and family disruption. Um, what you often find in these, and I'm focusing primarily on the Spanish surname individuals, are Latinas who broke the rules. Um, so they broke the rules who, um, you know, rebelled from their parents, they ended up on the streets, they were declared truants, they ended up in, you know, a, a Catholic home or in the juvenile court system. Also, what you find from these records is parents who often, on the other hand, tried to shield um, their children from the authority of eugenic laws. And I think this is an important, this is really one of the, one of the contributions I want to make to kind of Chicano and Latino history is bringing this into the fold and understanding the ways in which Latino families countered eugenics in California in the 20th century, which is something we haven't known much about until then. Um, also, you can see in these records, basically through the language of the sterilization orders themselves and thinking about the procedure and how it was enacted, how stigmatized and medical subjects were produced by the state through these documents, um, and how what was recorded at the moment sterilization was ordered. Um, and sometimes these, of course, they vary. Sometimes they're very perf they're perfunctory. It's just one page with the minimal information. Other times, it's always the historian's you know, I, historians get excited when we get lengthy documents that, you know, five pages of a family history so I can learn a lot more about what the life of that particular patient was. Um, the other really important thing about this is just as I was mentioning it was about reproductive control, it was also about sexual policing. We see this in the case of the young Latinas, but also as we move into the um, 1950s in particular to attempts to control deviant sexuality. So what I have for you here are I've extracted from some of these records. These are pseudonyms of some of the, this is the kind of information that you can gather by pulling it out of these, uh, these fairly, these bureaucratic documents. And this is from 1922, which is one of the first years that we have. Um, and this is a young, a young man, Mario Rodriguez, and we've, now we've, here we have another person who encountered Stockton um, in their time in California, admitted to Stockton in 1922. Um, oops, born in Mexico, um, and they will tell you what county he was sent from. So one of the things that I hope to do with the quantitative analysis is to figure out what's going on with different counties in California. And then, you know, I like this quote, Toxin uh, incoherently imagines, possesses large sums of money, um, states he is going to invade Mexico. Um, so these are kinds of some of the, the, the stories you would find, and general paralysis of the insane. So he is in the psychiatric institution, and in this case, the medical superintendent consented to sterilization. So moving seven years ahead, um, we have the case of a 17-year-old Latina, Dolores Perez, who was admitted to the Pacific Colony. Pacific Colony is a really inst interesting institution because it was created um, it was uh, appropriate, the money for it was appropriated, and it was really founded with the idea of housing the feeble-minded and the morons, particularly girls. And it took a while to get it up and running, but by the 1930s, it was performing uh, a, a significant number of sterilizations for a, fa a fairly small institution. Um, and as I mentioned before, the girls like this would end up at, um, you know, at Catholic homes. She had been at the co covenant of the Good Shepherd. And here we go, she was born out of wedlock and has been a ward of the state since 1925. Um, she's been picked up by the police many times. So this is where we also, this is where these documents have their limitations. So because it's just one page of her life at the one particular time in which the sterilization was ordered, we don't know what preceded this. 
but it could have been, you know, you think definitely family dislocation, perhaps an abusive situation, um, perhaps a disrupted family, but somehow she ended up um, as a ward of the state and under the care of, of very, various custodians. But in, somehow her mother consented to the sterilization. And let me just clarify this by saying that consent always has to be put in quotes because you have to think to an era in which many parents thought that doing sterilization was doing the correct thing, kind of, kind of out of charity for their children, and also the word of the physician or the word of the state authority was often taken as, you know, kind of just very good paternal instructions that should be followed. Um, here is another case um, moving kind of up in time, 1939, Marta Dominguez. Again, she was fairly young, admitted to Pacific Colony at the age of 15. She came from Arizona, so you, here you see the migratory paths. And one of the things that is exceedingly common in these cases is you can begin to, and this is something that my colleague Miroslava um, Chavez Garcia at UC Davis is doing, is she is uh, kind of beginning to put together some of the, uh, the family connections. So you will often find that entire sibling groups are identified, um, and they are often simultaneously institutionalized, and then there are attempts to sterilize them more or less at, at the same time. So her three half-sisters were deemed to have subnormal uh, mentality. Uh, mentally deficient girl, this is really capturing the language of the time, committed for training and supervision, afflicted with feeble-mindedness, and her father gave consent. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to include this is it shows that these um, cases go on full force into the 1950s, and I think this is something that's very important to note is that um, some people like to think that the eugenics movement ended after, you know, in 1945, you know, and even when the Nuremberg trials were going on. But eugenics laws as, and statutes stayed on the books in many states, and some states continued, had higher rates of sterilization into the 50s and 60s, such as North Carolina and Virginia. California's tapered off in the 1950s, but things were going pretty much full force until the early 1950s. And the Catholic Church made an intervention then, and things began to change in terms of thinking about um, issues of heredity and rehabilitation and so on. So there were various factors. But nonetheless, this is in 1950. And um, I'll just let you look at this, but it captures some of the patterns that I've been talking about. Again, young, 18 years old, mentally deficient, epileptic, runs away from home. So here's the truancy issue. Um, had seizures on the streets. It's unclear exactly what that would could mean. Those could actually be physiological uh, manifestations of a disease. They could also just be like rebellious attempts to get away from the authorities. Um, but you see what the diagnosis is. It's feeble-mindedness. And feeble-mindedness was often, was sometimes determined based on kind of an eyeball assessment of the, uh, of the patient, and sometimes based on an IQ test, um, which, as you can imagine, if you have mainly Spanish-speaking individuals and the test is given in English, you're not going to have great results. Um, oh, wait. And this is uh, one of the things about this is, again, it shows the, the attempts to classify as subnormal the entire family. But there's also an interesting family history about migratory past, the Mexican Revolution, her father, and so on. So there's really interesting borderland stories that can come out of looking at these snapshot documents. And here, the mother consented to the sterilization. Here, I'm just sharing with you what these sterilization orders actually look like. Um, and let's see. Okay, so basically one of the things that you see across time, that's from 1924, um, from Sonoma, is that things um, were not very standardized at the beginning, but by the late 1930s, a very standardized form had been implemented. So it shows the increasing bureaucratization of the process and the way which became it became more streamlined. And that makes sense because we're talking about superintendents from 11 different institutions sending in a high volume of documents that really peaked in the late 30s and 1940s. Um, can you make out any of the words there? Oh, okay, I hope you can see some of it. It's a little bit blurry, but basically, you know, it's here's the key language, which is, as this patient is suffering from a mental affliction, and this comes straight from the statute, which may have been, which may have been inherited and is likely to become transmitted <coughs> to descendants. Um, we should, uh, basically, we should uh, approve their operation for sterilization. So that's kind of the key language there is likely to be inheritant and probably will be transmitted to descendants. Um, 
again, I'm just kind of moving across time with these sterilization orders so you can get a flavor of what they looked like. And here's another one from Sonoma, which, as I mentioned, was one of the uh, sterilized the, the, the Sonoma and Patton, the highest numbers um, in the entire country. In Sonoma, it was largely due to this one superintendent who some of you may have heard of, Fred Butler, whose oral history is actually at the Bancroft Library, part of this great the UCB regional oral history program, which has done extensive interviews around issues of mental health in California, which has allowed me to contextualize a lot of this. Um, Butler's, uh, uh, his uh, interview is very interesting because one of the things that he says is he was so gung-ho about sterilization that he basically offered up his um, his surgery suite as a revolving door for young girls to be sterilized. And he claimed that 25% of the sterilizations that occurred at Sonoma were girls who had been sent up for sterilization only. And this indeed is one of these, uh, one of these cases. You see up here it says sterilization only. So what they did here is they just grabbed the surgical consent form from the Los Angeles General Hospital, crossed that out, put in Sonoma. Again, this is before it had gotten very standardized and then sent this girl up for sterilization to Sonoma in 1928. Um, this is Pacific Colony, 1929. So imagine, I have 15,000 of these documents, and I'm trying to figure out you know, how to combine this quantitative and this qualitative analysis. And also, there's so many different stories. And you know, some stories are more typical but I don't want to fall into a trap of thinking essentializing experiences or having one typical experience. And there's also really some that are much more interesting that are outliers. Um, this is the form in 1936 after it became more standardized. And just to give you a sense of this, that after this, every institution used this form. And it said legal provisions. And then this, you had to check one of these three boxes. So why is the sterilization being ordered? Well. <coughs> The person, does the per person have a mental disease, epilepsy, or feeble-mindedness, which required usually a, um, an IQ classification, you know, a kind of psychometric classification with perversion or marked departure from normality, which could describe a lot of people, uh, I know. <laughs> but um, again, these are just the kinds of documents that uh, again, the standardized forms from Sonoma in 1938. These are the kinds of letters that would often accompany them. Um, and one of the things in the last point I, I, we saw is that uh, on the one hand, the justification for sterilizations was about reproductive control and this idea of you know, stemming bad heredity. You know, um, uh, in the reproductive, at the reproductive system itself. But also, one of the things that's very important to note, and other scholars have written about this, Wendy Klein and others, is that sterilization was as much about sexual control and sexual policing of the body as it was about reproductive control. And one of the ways you can see this is that sterilization, I mean, there's sterilization initially was, um, the transition to sterilization came out of the initial calls for castration in the late 19th century, which this person who came up with the sterilization law in Indiana had been experimenting with. He decided then that vasectomy was the way to go to control sexual offenders. So that has kind of a long history and even relates to how we think about today issues of how do you control sexual predators and, and things like that. Um, but one of the things that, you can, that I can also mine these records for is to look at what I consider to be a forgotten facet of gay and lesbian history, which is the forced sterilization in particular of men who appear to be effeminate or men who are having sex with men. It's not that we need to classify them necessarily as gay, but the point is, is that that's how they were classified by the documents themselves. And that was, um, and that was their, their crime or their deviation from, um, uh, from normality. So you'll find sodomy as a justification given. And um, yeah, so this is just a, a 1950s Los Angeles Times article which captures some of that. So um, one of the, in closing, one of the things that um, I'd like to point out, and this has been coming to me slowly as we've been working on these documents, is that I really think that in these documents, we can find a longer history of Latino and Chicano resistance to eugenics and engagement with the state and medicine. Um, 
It's very interesting. You, I found in the documents, the, and I, this I wouldn't want to quantify, obviously, but um, it seems to me that there's a higher number of Latino parents who refuse sterilization for their children. And it is often, from what I can tell, the Mexican-American parents who will fight back the most. So in other words, how do they fight back? They receive a request from the superintendent to have their child sterilized, they say no. They receive a second request, they say no. I mean, there's numerous instances. Sometimes they give in, and often they were overridden. Um, there is a case, the 1931 case of Jose Ramos and his three sons. So again, Fred Butler, who I mentioned, uh, who was the superintendent at Sonoma for about 30 years, stated that the sterilization of one son so he can never reproduce his kind, for we know from experience that individuals of his mentality should never uh, bear offspring as they are usually defective in some manner. And so Butler pleaded with uh, Mr. Ramos to have his son sterilized, and he said no, and he actually went to the officer in the San Francisco court who had had his son committed in the first place and said, no, I don't want this, I never agreed to it, and eventually he was overridden. Um, and I found many examples of this which I don't have time to go into, but again, this is very revealing. On the other hand, I don't have that much information, so there's the question of why. You know, does it have to do with issues of religion and Catholicism? Does it have to do with certain understandings of family? Does it have to do with a whole range of things that we could, that I'll be looking at as I figure this out? One of the most interesting cases is, and I mentioned before that there was no serious challenge, or there was no um, Supreme Court challenge to California sterilization law, as there was in other states like Indiana and Washington, and I could go on. Um, but there was one case that rose to the appellate level in 1939, and 1939 was the height of, of sterilization rates in um, California. Um, this was a case filed by Sarah Rosas Garcia against what was then the State Department of Institutions, as it was called at the time. Um, and she filed it on behalf of her 19-year-old daughter who was held at Pacific Colony, like many of the young Latinas that I showed you before. And she got a lawyer to you know, argue her case, I think pro bono, and he basically, he made, he pulled out all the punches. It was unconstitutional, it violated due process, the 14th Amendment, I mean, he tried everything, cruel and unusual punishment, everything that had been tried against sterilization statutes. Um, and they lost this case, and they didn't appeal it. And I did find that her daughter was sterilized against her wishes um, in 1941. So if this case had gotten out, the judgment was also three to two. And there was actually a very interesting um, rebuttal, uh, uh, a, a disagreement with the, with the decision that I don't have time to go into, but the language on that really supported the mother and it's very interesting. Um, so one of the things I'm suggesting is that, you know, it's when I, I wrote an article a few years ago that was looking at what happened in 1979, which was when Art Torres, at the time, who was representing his constituents in, in East Los Angeles, went ahead and pushed for the repeal of the sterilization law that had been on the books since 1909, because he was just outraged that it was going on, and he knew about what had been happening at Los Angeles General Hospital, which was non-consensual sterilization of Chicanas, which resulted in the case Madrigal versus Killigan. Um, I was thinking, you know, I connected that to the longer history of eugenics in California, but I really didn't have the pieces to connect it to a longer history of what I would call Latino resistance um, to eugenics and sterilization. But I think that in this documents, and you know, I don't want to overstate the case, but I do think that there's something there. And I think that this is part of a longer trajectory that per goes back to the kinds of issues that my colleague Miroslava talks about in the 19th century and sexual control of Mexican women, and also all the way to the, um, you know, thinking about Proposition 187 and kind of the different, um, you know, uh, the, the different constitutional issues there related to, um, you know, immigrants and reproductive control. So thank you for listening, and I welcome your comments. <laughs>